Okay, I think this is where we left off, um, talking about the complications of cirrhosis. Um, and we will start with hepatic encephalopathy. Um, hepatic encephalopathy can be acute and reversible, or it can be chronic and progressive. The chronic progressive would be a terminal condition. Acute and reversible um, hepatic encephalopathy will occur in any condition where the liver damage causes ammonia to enter the systemic circulation without be being detoxified be by the liver. Now, if it's not um, caused by a precipitating event, rather it is because of the progression of the disease and, you know, nothing can make it better, then, of course, it is more of the um, chronic version, the terminal version. Um, but basically what happens is ammonia comes from the gut bacteria and from the breakdown of amino acids. And normally that ammonia goes to the liver um, through the portal circulation, as does all blood from the GI system. In the liver then it's converted to urea. That urea then is sent to the kidneys and the kidneys eliminate it. When blood is shunted past the liver, or if the liver can't detoxify the ammonia, then the ammonia levels will increase. Those ammonia levels will cross the blood-brain barrier and you have um, neurologic effects. These neurologic effects can occur either suddenly or gradually depending on whether this is an acute situation or chronic progressive. Hepatic encephalopathy being, can be graded and um, many patients with cirrhotic um, disease will have minimal hepatic encephalopathy. That's a grade one. And in these patients, you'll see a lack of, a trivial lack of awareness. Um, they either are high or they're anxious. Their attention span is shortened. And in the, um, the task of addition, they don't do that well. In grade two, the patient becomes more lethargic they are um, they are minimally disoriented for time and place. They have some personality changes. Their behavior may be inappropriate. Um, they may have impairment in subtraction functions. By a grade three, you're looking at um, a somnolent to semi-stuporous person, confusion, pretty disoriented. In grade four, that patient is unresponsive to verbal or to noxious stimuli. Now, um, in addition to the change in level of consciousness, the hallmark of hepatic encephalopathy on the physical exam is the presence of asterixis. Um, this is detected by having the patient hold out their outstretched arms and hands while they cock their wrists back. And if they have asterixis, they'll have a, a non-synchronized flapping motion at the wrist. Now, um, asterixis is not specific just for um, hepatitis. It can happen in um, some other disease states that cause um, some encephalopathies like renal failure and carbon dioxide retention can cause asterixis to happen. Now, fetter hepaticus is another um, symptom of en hepatic encephalopathy. The patient has a musty, sweet odor from the accumulation of digestive byproducts that the liver just can't break down. Okay, some of the things that can precipitate hepatic encephalopathy. Um, certainly, hepatic encephalopathy can be progressive and terminal, but it can also be acute and reversible. And in the patient who's got pre-existing liver disease, these are some of the things that can put them over the edge. Um, GI bleeding is a pretty classic puts you over the edge kind of a thing. Uh, we've talked about this in class. Blood in the GI tract is broken down and the protein part gets broken down and increases the ammonia load. The other problem that a person who is GI bleeding has is they are in hypovolemic shock and that shock state doesn't allow the liver to be properly perfused and so you don't have blood going to the liver to have the ammonia load addressed 
So you got both ends, increased ammonia load and decreased detoxification of ammonia. Again, we're looking at a situation where there is already some pre-existing liver disease. So that's one. Another precipitator of hepatic encephalopathy can be just an increase in dietary protein. Another would be low potassiums. Um, the brain absolutely needs potassium to break down ammonia. Reasons that our um, patients with uh, liver cirrhosis have low potassium would be because of the hyperaldosteronism that's occurring, because the liver doesn't break down these steroids, and then also the diuretics that they receive. Um, hypoxia is another precipitator. This will increase the acute toxicity of ammonia. Central nervous system depressant drugs will add a depressive effect. If the patient um, has acute infection, they will break down tissues, which increase the ammonia load. And if you increase the transit time of stuff in the gut, you know, take, make it take longer to get through, then more ammonia absorption will occur. How is hepatic encephalopathy addressed? Well, you want to reduce the ammonia formation. That's critical. Um, so along with assessing neurostatus every one to two hours to see where you're at, um, some other things that will happen is the patient will be on a very severe protein restriction, down to zero if you need to, and then you can increase it to one and a half kilograms per day, I'm sorry, one and a half grams per kilogram per day when that encephalopathy is cleared. The patient needs um, plenty of calories, but they should be high carb, moderately low fat. They re you have to restrict um, physical activity because ammonia is a byproduct of metabolism, therefore you're going to restrict that physical activity. The, um, the intestine uh, there's an effort to sterilize the intestine, um, orally neomycin or rectal neomycin. Um, neomycin is renal toxic, but when you put it in the gut, it's pretty poorly absorbed. The only time you should ever see an IV neomycin given, and I have given IV neomycin, but it's to a patient who's on already end-stage renal um, because it's extremely renal toxic. Um, lactulose. The goal of lactulose therapy is four to six loose stools a day. Lactulose will increase, um, I'm sorry, lactulose will decrease the transit time, getting stools through the GI tract faster. It decreases intestinal pH, which will decrease bacterial growth. Um, the pH will drop from seven to five with the use of lactulose. And then the other thing that lactulose does is it pulls water into the colon um, producing an osmotic laxative and then all that stuff is expelled. Again, the goal is four to six loose stools a day um, in order to address the hepatic encephalopathy. You want to monitor fluid and electrolytes balance um, for all of these reasons. The, the patient needs to abstain from alcohol and this is a situation where we're not going to give Tylenol. Tylenol is a very, very benign drug, except in liver failure. Um, the final thing that happens to manage hepatic encephalopathy is a liver transplant. Um, remember that there are some of those, like the TIPS procedure, um, the shunting makes it more likely that the patient is going to have problems with hepatic encephalopathy because you're creating... Um, real specific ways of bypassing the liver because of the portal hypertension. Um, another complication is hepatorenal syndrome. Uh, this is a uh, renal failure. The exact cause is unknown, but what they find is that the functional, um, there's a functional renal failure without any structural abnormality of the kidneys and it's really thought to be related to redistribution of blood flow from the kidneys to peripheral and splanchnic circulation or because of the hypovolemia secondary to ascites. 
The hypovolemia secondary to ascites promotes renal vasoconstriction. It's probably a combination of this. It happens in more 40% of patients with cirrhosis, but when um, liver is transplanted, the kidney failure will reverse. Um, I think this is a good stopping point. We'll cover that with the next slideshow.